You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome back to Music Tectonics, where we go beneath the surface of music and tech. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa. I'm also the CEO and founder of Rock Paper Scissors, a music tech PR firm. So today we have one of the oldest music tech companies in the world on the show. Remember piano rolls? They were the flash drives of the 1890s, and there was a battle to make sure that player piano manufacturers compensated composers and songwriters for the use of their songs on this newfangled technology. Well, that battle took place in 1909, but today's story starts in 1927 when the National Music Publishers Association started the Harry Fox Agency. HFA, as you may know, works with over 50,000 publishers, 2,500 record labels, and relevant to many of our listeners, all types of music distributors, ranging from streaming services and tablature and lyrics companies, fitness apps, background music, karaoke, AR, VR, all the types of companies we've talked about, talked to on, on the show, online video services, and more to manage data, rights, and royalties. HFA Rumblefish came out to the Music Tectonics Conference last month, and since they help so many sides of the music ecosystem with rights and royalty administration, including working with music tech startups, we thought it would be good to have their CEO, Michael Simon, join us on the podcast to talk about how they work with music tech startups and the music industry as a whole. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thanks, Dimitri. <laughs> Great to have you here. So look, I'm going to dive in. I thought it would be fun to kick off by talking through that original use case of piano rolls and the origin of mechanical licensing, and then compare that with the types of use cases you or I might hear about from music startups today. Are you game for that? Why, yes, I am. <laughs> Okay. Let's ha let's let's let it happen and see where it goes. <laughs> All right. Okay. So what was happening when HFA was first formed? Why did mechanical licensing and HFA come into being? A very simple proposition. People weren't paying. And when I say people, people means those who were reproducing compositions, record companies, for example, were either not acknowledging the existence of a right or not acknowledging the existence of a publisher. And there was a guy. People wonder, is Harry Fox our founder, like on the side of the truck? And there was a guy, and his name was Harry Fox, and he worked for the Music Publishers Protective Association. And someone asked Harry to go down to Tin Pan Alley off of Broadway in the 20s in New York City and talk to some people who needed to be talked to about rights and royalties. And Harry was a persuasive guy. He may have had some enhancements for his conversation that encouraged people to be more participatory things that might have looked like baseball equipment maybe i don't know but i've heard stories and they found mr fox persuasive and he developed the rapport and the licensing mechanisms to aggregate the industry the publishers thought this is great we have someone who brings us all together and presents us to the record companies the record companies eventually thought great. Instead of trying to find thousands of publishers, we can talk to this guy, Harry Fox, which became the Harry Fox office, which was his office at the Protective Association. Physically, his office became the Harry Fox office, and the license became called the Harry Fox or the Harry Fox license. He ran the business until the late 60s, early wow. 70s, something like that. When, when I first started at HFA and someone retired, they talked about they started working at HFA for Harry Fox. They were his secretary. Wow. That's the the short of how this started dealing with the new technology of music reproduction and a guy and a bat. And here we are. <laughs> and here we are now. Wow, that's great. I haven't heard the story told quite like that. So it's great to hear it straight from the guy who heard it straight from the person who heard it straight from the fox himself. <laughs> that that is almost Exactly how it happened. We've I've met with his son. Oh well, wow. cool. So so let, let's 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 get a little more specific. How does this piano roll story apply to what you do today, especially as it relates to music tech companies? Maybe you could walk us walk us through that. Well, let's let's step back and acknowledge that in the music business, every time, whether it's piano roll or anything else, every time a new technology is introduced we in the music business believe we've never seen anything like it. We don't understand what it is, and it's likely going to destroy the industry almost every time. 
Historically, music business disruptions always follow the introduction of new reproduction and distribution technologies. And every single time we begin with terror and we end with rights and royalties, it's, the, it's a recurring cycle in our business that routinely runs from massive dislocation through a period of stabilization to a period during which real dollars generated by destabilizing technology are distributed to the creative community. The piano roll is just one of them. Over the course of 120 years or so, we've seen what you said in the beginning, piano rolls, cylinders, flat disks, radios, cassettes, MP3s, the internet and all of its glory. And in every one of those moments, there was definitely a chicken little experience of, oh my goodness, it's going to destroy the industry. I mean, imagine, take an example, imagine the record player invented something in like the 1870s, a machine that made and played back wax cylinders. Uh, I have some in my office. If this was visual, you would see the wax cylinder player sitting behind me. That machine is miraculous. That machine was also terrifying. The, the music playing machines were a serious threat to live performance. And they were a serious threat to the sheet music business. They diverted live audiences and manufacturers weren't, as we discussed at the beginning, paying composers royalties. And when you extract that to the modern era, hmm, cannibalization and composers getting stiffed. Does that sound familiar? It's a recurring three theme, but what happened? In 1909, as you said, royalty structures and rights were worked out. The business began to stabilize and money moved. Same thing with, with radio. Radio was so scary. It was a threat to, if you can listen to music on the radio, if people are playing records on the radio, I don't need to buy them anymore, which is another one of those, hmm, that's a free to consumer proposition. That's terrifying. And we thought radio would kill the music business. Once again, rights and royalties got worked out and radio became a significant driver of economic activity in our industry. It goes on and on. Some of us are old enough to remember taking vinyl records out of the sleeves and on the interior inner sleeve, there would be a printing that's a pr language that would say cassettes kill and a skull and crossbones over the cassette because home taping was gonna kill the industry. Eventually cassettes overtook vinyl as a sales medium. So we routinely think that music technology is new. And we're gonna talk later about the most newfangled version of music technology. But HFA has been around, as Dimitri said, since 1927, and we've gone through many, many technology cycles, and we see that they repeat. They start with terror. They then become rationalized. The rights become clear. The royalties start to move, and we move into a new distribution format. And for my children, they aren't they, streaming. All the new models, they are from birth normalized. They didn't go through the experience we went through of trying to figure out what that experience is, just like people trying to figure out the piano plays by itself. I guess I don't need to buy sheet music anymore. Think of all the sheet music publishers who had to explain to their family that they may be going out of business until they realize they're not sheet music publishers, they're publishers and there are rights and they can move into the next era. So that's, that's the longer point of view on really piano rolls, but also just the introduction, recurring introduction of technology into our industry. Love it. I love that that great contextual um, um, sort of overview as we dive in. But let's get a little bit more specific about the piano rolls, and then we'll go into these more more uh, modern day use cases so we can sort of see how you think about this and see how this applies. Uh, let's take the piano roll example, and then we'll apply that elsewhere and see if it still kind of holds up the same way. What? So you mentioned you mentioned these um, sheet sheet music publishers that was disrupted by these piano rolls. What what was the what was the 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 role of mechanical licensing with piano rolls? Why I mean, why is it called mechanical license, for example? Um, and and let's spell that out. Well, there was a fair amount of debate in the early days. If you read the old cases from before 1909, there was a debate about the definition of mechanical and a debate about reproduction. And the the there were actually some cases that aren't good law anymore that said that piece of there's a piece of paper that has holes in it that connect to a wheel inside of a piano. And as those wheels turn, it pulls the paper through and that signals which keys on the piano to play. The piano is mechanically playing. 
but someone said, some judge said, but if I look at that piece of paper, I don't see notes. I don't see, eventually you did see lyrics. If she, I would show you them. The, the piano rolls in my office actually have lyrics on the side that scrolled by the window. But they said, this isn't music. You can't, you can't read it and figure out how to play an instrument from it. So there was debate about whether or not it was a reproduction of music. Eventually, think about it in the most modern sense. It's the code. If I look at the code, code bases are ones and zeros. The code that instructs my computer to sound like the Flamin' Groovies or the Flamin' Lips or any other band that you like, it's ones and zeros. I can't see the music in that code any more than I can see the music in that piano roll. But that piano roll, as code, tells the piano how to mechanically play in a way that when you're standing in front of it, you hear the ode to joy and you hear music. And over time, the law evolved to recognize that that piano roll as code was actually core to mechanically reproducing or enabling the mechanical reproduction of a composition. The composition is the song as opposed to the recording of the song, like the master recording, you know, the, the record of the song. Awesome. So um, I, I love that the way you've painted the picture now, because what you're saying is everyone thought what they could read as sheet music or as lyrics on a piece of paper was the composition, was the music, was the visual representation of the music, what would be behind what somebody would play or record or anything like that. But then uh, there was that realization that also these little cutouts in the, the, the paper, these little notch, these little holes in the paper in different locations on the paper as it related to the machine that was going to be played back was actually a representation too. So it wasn't even anything that was written down. It was just the actual artistic creation, the relationship of the notes to each other and how they were put together and the lyrics that went with it and so forth. So anything that comes after the piano roll is similarly could be seen as a code. And that's where it'll get interesting for us to talk a little bit about, you know, what comes next. I'm going to, I want to, I want to challenge you to a game of the, the, the rights use case game, but I want to take a quick break first. When we come back, I've got some questions for you to see how we can apply the piano roll story to other types of technology. We'll be right back. Did you have trouble catching all of the presentations at the online music tectonics conference last month? Don't worry, the Music Tectonics app now has most of the sessions on video for you to check out. You can get the Music Tectonics app at the Apple App Store or Google Play App Store. Just look for Music Tectonics and you'll be able to download it for free. It's a great place to network, connect, and catch new information about the music tech space and catch those videos from the Music Tectonics conference. Download it now. Okay, we are back. And like I said before the break, I want to play the rights use case game with you, Michael. But before we do, tell us why we hear the combined name HFA Rumblefish. Is it one company or do the two entities offer something different? It's one company with two brands. HFA represents music publishers for many of their mechanical reproduction needs, the mechanical type that we were talking about before. Whereas Rumblefish helps startups and established companies that either have a vision for a new music related offering or want to expand their current offerings. It's much more of a service business, Rumblefish. It's a suite of rights administration services and is actually the go-to resource for music licensing, music data, and for royalty management needs. Is it sort of like they're serving, they're serving two different parts of the ecosystem? Could you think of it that way? Yeah, or it could be that the skill sets are similar in the two companies, but it's different audiences. Not always different audiences, but it is often different audiences, meaning we are still managing composition data, managing royalty data, managing usage data, helping identify what, what songs are being used in what way and who controls those rights. But at HFA, a record company is coming to me and telling me they need rights from me for works that I represent. At Rumblefish, among the many use cases, a, a service could come to me and say, I've obtained rights, but I don't know which compositions are in the rights basket, or I need your help obtaining rights from third parties, or I've obtained the rights and I know what they are, but I don't know how to calculate royalties. And I certainly don't have, I, the new business, don't have the connectivity to pay 300,000 people monthly, but you do. So we have a global skill set in rights administration that we 
we deploy across multiple brands for multiple purposes. And HFA is the, the home to representing publishers for mechanical reproduction. Rumblefish is the home to helping new and even now, because we've been around for a while, legacy businesses who have music-related offerings and need to expand them in, in licensing data and royalty management. Okay, cool. I'm glad we clarified that. Um, let's get back to our use case game. I'm going to dive in here. If a company that is launching a jukebox to be used in any, say, metaverse platform reaches out to you and tells you that metaverseians can log in with their avatar and go play music on that virtual jukebox in a virtual world, what do you say, Michael? What I don't say is what we just talked about for the last 20 minutes, which is to try to make somebody feel bad by saying, I know you think you're doing something shocking and new and innovative and the consumer experience may be, but there's a composition, there's an owner of the composition, there's some form of reproduction, which we can get into in a minute, and there's some form of distribution and consumption. There are rights, there are economics. I don't mean to be reductive, but I think we can help you figure this out at Rumblefish and help you figure out how to launch that business so you can take people's credit cards in the metaverse and give them credit to play music in the jukebox, in the bar, in Jumbo Town, <laughs> whatever that is. So, I mean, we can we should dig a little bit deeper into that framework. What we what we are what we are tasked with at Rumblefish, we meet between 500 and 1,000 companies a year, who are each trying to launch something brand new, a new consumer experience. They may array into five to ten use types. But across those use types, they're doing what I just said. They're engaging in some form of reproduction and distribution or making available of a composition. And we help them. We, don't, we do not provide legal advice, but we help them understand what the experience is and how we can layer in our skill set to help them take what they think is an in-the-clouds idea to run it to ground so that those who control rights are happy to grant the rights to them as opposed to happy to chase them around because they didn't obtain the rights. That's an unfortunate outcome. We want to empower as many businesses as we can so we can see where the uptake is and create, help people create the most captivating user experiences. So in your specific example, Jukebox in the Metaverse, someone who doesn't do what I do all day might say, where's the reproduction? Your answer may very well be somewhere on the planet, there is a server that has embodied on that server a recording of the new Glass Animals single. And in that recording of the new Glass Animals single is a composition controlled by a publisher. And that publisher has an amount of control over whether or not you can embody that composition in that server as does the record company that controls that master recording. And if we start there and then apply a framework to the compositions, the recordings, the owners, there, there, are, there are times, because we don't provide legal advice, that we say, we are very happy to identify the owners and then administer whatever the rights are that you've agreed upon with those owners meaning the Rumblefish business has a direct deal administration business where the metaverse bar owner or the platform operator goes out into the marketplace and speaks with music publishers for a very long time until they develop an understanding of what those rights are and what the economics can be. And then they come back to us and we help them tie the songs of those publishers to the deals that they did and then help them apply the economic provisions in order to calculate the royalties manage the usage data, and then report and pay that out. So I hate to be the person who takes the most progressive idea and render it mundane, but, <laughs> but, but you can imagine in 1909, someone said, I have this black, flat, shiny thing, and I'm going to stick a metal needle in it, and I'm going to spin it around, and you're going to think that in the room is the Louis Armstrong Hot Five. That is... That is magical. That's like the metaverse of its day. That's a magical <laughs> experience. And, you know, Harry Fox, the guy, said, well, there's a composition. And there's, I mean, he probably didn't say it this way. He probably said something more colorful. Uh, but we're professionals now. <laughs> and uh, 
which is sometimes unfortunate. I miss that. <laughs> I miss that other business of, you know, the old music business that some of us come from. But, but the only way to really deal with this is to try to apply a rational framework as opposed to saying, wow, that is crazy. We don't know what to do. Is there a composition? Is there a recording? Is there a reproduction? Is there a distribution? Is it a capital D distribution, like it moved from point A to point B? Or is there a lowercase distribution where someone causes it to be transmitted into the ether sphere and someone perceives it? And you know, getting into perception versus an asset moving, I sell you a record, I don't have it now, you do. I stream a file, I, I stream a composition to you, I have it and you have it. There's There's a lot of laws of physics involved, but the way we work is to try to apply a framework to what's happening in whatever new progressive environment we're experiencing. Well, I mean, that the way you just framed it makes me think of another potential use case, not one that I've actually heard, but let's just let's 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 keep you running through the running through the exercise here. Let's say I'm going to launch a company that puts a chip in your brain. And once that trips in your brain, you'll hear these songs virtually in your brain. It won't make any audible sound. Nobody there won't even be an audible sound in your in your skull. Right. You you can think of a lyric and recall a song. You can uh, maybe say play play that funky music and something comes up. Uh, but nobody else is going to hear it. You're just sort of, like you said, it's perceiving. That's okay, right? There's, 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 the, you know, it's all in your head, right? If you imagine a song, you don't have to pay for it. So if there's a chip there, do you need to pay for anything? Do you need to like license anything? You're asking that question in exactly the way people ask me that question in the hopes that I will give them the answer that you would be looking for, which is, yeah, it's totally fine. Don't worry about it. And not only are they happy with that answer, but they can say, an expert in the industry has told me, and we're going to rely on that. So I, of course, begin by telling them there are many great entertainment lawyers and IP lawyers in the world. Sometimes they're even the same person. And you should speak to them to try to understand what that is, because I have an opinion, but I'm not your lawyer. My opinion is, just like in the metaverse example, what is that chip? Is that a reproduction? Is there a composition on there? When I am triggering through my mitochondria and my synapses in order to hear play that funky music am i hearing the original master recording too only in my head and if so there's a recording and we can very quickly get back to who controls the composition and you can find it it may be a different number of chips that are manufactured and the rights holders may want to talk, talk about is it a manufacturing is the is the economic model only one chip is manufactured, so there's only one one reproduction. Or are they going to try to count uses, which would be a little bit Aldous Huxley? I'm going to get a little too Aldous Huxley and Brave New World on me if we're going to start putting a counter in your head of how many times you experienced it. But let's put that aside for the next conversation. In this particular conversation, you can make this, again, more mundane. There was a time when someone said, we have flash memory and we want to sell these devices for 100 bucks, and we want to have 200,000 compositions on them. What is that? A mechanical reproduction under the US Copyright Act is a manufacturing and distribution to the public for private use, with many more words in the Copyright Act. So someone might debate that that wasn't a distribution to the public for private use or wait until they play all 150,000 of them the ones that are there that aren't played, they don't count. Someone else would say, but I bought Edgar Winter's Frankenstein album and I only listened to the song Frankenstein and all the other songs on that record were never played, but yet you paid a mechanical royalty for each composition on there. You can have a healthy debate about how that works out. But in your brain chip example, say someone says there's a real market, says there's a real market for that and they make 100,000 chips and each one of them has the same 10 songs on it. So a million reproductions of compositions happen there. It's not a hard conversation to start. It's really not totally sci-fi. The, the planting the chip part might be, but the rights environment, you are, you are embodying my composition on a chip. What's the difference between that chip and a CD or flash memory or memory on a USB drive. You're reproducing my composition. You might be reproducing a master recording. You're making some number of them. There are people who control those rights. And if you walked in the door of Rumblefish, 
we would we would again apply a rubric and say we can help you identify who the rights holders are. You may need to speak to them directly in order for them to become comfortable about what that right is, because it may not be a pure play mechanical and it may not be a pure play public performance and whatever all the other rights synchronization. Just wait till calling up that song actually puts a video. So now I can see Dimitri walking down the beach over Machine Gun Kelly's Forget You and Halsey's standing in the corner and wait a minute, now it turns into the metaverse and I can actually go over and start talking to Hall in an avatar. I can see this world coming, but if we just start with our rubric, is there a composition? Is there a recording? Who controls it? What are the rights? If the rights are unknown, just like at the beginning of radio, rights were ambiguous until they got clarified or piano rolls where there was a lot of lawsuits about what they were. The rights holders will have an opinion about those rights. When the rights get shored up, we will administer them. All right. You know what, Michael? I think those were too easy for you. I think I think uh, like we we need to get you even further down the path to see if this this you keep talking about this rubric. We'll talk about this rubric after this. But let's there there are all these cool generative music companies that are doing a lot of interesting things. So so let's do one more and then and then we'll move on. But what would you say to a company that allows artists to change a song every time they play it? And we've seen some things like that come out or or one whose songs change every time you play them. Like there's no original single version of a song how does that fit into all this uh this isn't the the this isn't a legal analysis i'm about to provide but okay keep in mind for those of us who know what vinyl turntables look like if you turn the knob to the left all the way you'll hear some instruments and if you turn the knob to the right you'll hear some instruments but all of the tracks that comprise the entire recording are embedded in that and the user is driving the outcome or Mm or the Flaming Lips Zarika album, which was originally released on multiple CDs. And depending on which one you played, you heard only the tracks that were on that particular CD of a composition. And if you played them all at the same time by putting boom boxes in a row, you could hear the whole thing. Um, That's crazy. There, there, is a, there is a history of the user having an impact. Your stereo is better than mine. You've got more low frequency and high frequency. I never knew there was a bassoon on Ferry Across the Mersey by Jerry and the Pacemakers. I didn't, you know, I made that up. I have no idea if there was, but so of course, if what you're talking about is like stems, where someone says, I'm gonna record, I'm gonna record a rock song with two guitars, bass, drums, keyboards, three vocalists. I'm gonna record them all as individual tracks. I'm going to allow the user to select which guitar, which tracks. I'm going to allow them to alter the tempo. I'm going to allow them to remove the background vocals or in the classic Richard Pryor show moment, have only and the pips and no Gladys Knight, which is truly fantastic. Everyone should look for that online at your favorite online video provider and hear and the pips with no Gladys Knight singing only the background vocals. Exceptional ridiculously funny and exceptional there's a there's an experience already of people being able to alter the music there are legal as if you're talking about an existing composition that the artist recorded but didn't write there they may end up having to go into the bunny hole of are, are they altering the original work to the level that it constitutes under the copyright act of derivative work which has a different permission environment than a more close reproduction of the composition. But again, I'm going to become the most boring person because no matter what someone does, I start with, is there a composition? Who controls the composition? Is there a recording? Who controls the recording? And in that example, I I, I remember in the old days of learning Beatles drum parts and doing exactly what I said, using the knob on my receiver to turn it all the way to the left because only on the left was only the bass and the drums and I could hear Ringo more clearly to learn the drum part. And no one said, that's generative. You're only listening to the drummer. They said, that's how the receiver works. The example you're giving is a very forward, interesting example that begs a lot of legal questions which go beyond the scope of this conversation about, let's uh, pick a song Say I want to do Despacito, and 
I want to record vocals in English and Spanish and Turkish. And I want to record it with a version. I, I want to record congas and timbales and cowbells and a bass line and guitars and drums and keyboards. And I want to have a kalimba African thumb piano. And I'm, and I'm going to allow the user to decide they want to hear Despacito in Turkish with only a kalimba. Or in fact, they want to hear it in Spanish once and then in English once. And they want to have the lyrics scrolling so they can learn the translation. I would still start with, is there a composition? Is there, you've heard it too many times for me to need to say it again. But I would start by thinking through what are the base elements. And then I would wonder whether or not the rights holders need to be directly involved because the usage is unique enough that their business affairs teams and their strategy teams need to decide how to grant those rights. But again, we, we have these, conf- this, this, is not, this is not future state weirdness. This is every day people are speaking to our strategy team and our biz dev team, my friends, Ryan and Charles and Luke and Lauren, and they, they're getting these phone calls where someone says, I'm gonna tell you something you've never heard before. And they don't wanna say, oh, I've heard it before, even if they have. And they don't wanna say, this isn't so unusual, there's a composition, but in their mind, just like the chip where you can't hear it, what you can't hear that's going through their mind is a lot of what we're talking about right now. Got it. Got it. Yeah. No, this it's been fun to go through each of these use cases, starting with the piano roll all the way through these others, because it does keep coming back to it. I mean, I think I was going to ask you, like, break down the framework, but I think you already have broken down the framework. I think you've already every time you ask those questions about, you know, is there a composition? Who owns the rights to that composition? And, and you know, how, what are you know, is there is there a master recording as well? And and how are you using all those different components and whatever the new technology is? It's it is I think it's helpful. Helpful. I think it's been a really helpful exercise. Listen, um, before uh, before I ask you one more cu- one more question and, and wrap things up, we're going to take a quick break. But when I come back, I know that you run your own label and your own publishing company. I want to ask you a little bit about that because I think it'll be fun to hear. We'll be right back. Whoa, the ideas are flying fast on this episode. If you want to follow up on anything we're talking about today, we've made it easy. Head over to musictectonics.com and find this episode on the podcast page. You'll see show notes full of links and a timestamp roadmap of the conversation. We're not responsible for internet rabbit holes you tumble down in the process. Now, let's get back to the conversation. All right. We had a great time talking through various use cases. And, and I said right before the break, Michael, I wanted to ask you, separate from your role at HFA Rumblefish, you run a publishing company, you run a record label, your own, your own companies. How has that informed the work you do? I don't operate in, within a theoretical framework, which doesn't mean that those who don't operate a record company or who make a pub, you know, run a publishing company can't do what we do. Brilliant people do what we do without also making records. But from where I sit, the fact that I physically make records, meaning we mix them, we master them, we cut them on a lathe, I deliver the parts to a place in northern New Jersey to cut the metal stampers, I ship those stampers to a vinyl plant, I talk about the matrix, I scroll secret messages into the vinyl near the label. Because do you really? Us, yes, because some of oh. us remember that from like the secret besides the matrix number sometimes there's a i can't believe you're reading this or some other note there or some of the lyrics and as fun as that part is the fact that i work from end to end in the business all the way through to getting it uploaded and seeing it on spotify and dealing with i assign isrcs i I assign the unique identifier for the master recording that is called an isrc that some people are familiar with in my publishing company, I'm interested in the unique identifiers that those in the industry might call an IPI number or an ISWC. And I'm very careful about when I upload the data, I'm very careful about what the writer's name is and what name the writer wants to use. I don't just say, ah, it's my friend and his name is A. Levy, or it could be Adam Leonardson Levy or Adam. Le-. I'm very deliberate about what their name is and how to use it because that data propagates around the world. And it becomes very hard to unstick. And that data drives the revenue 
and it drives the rights management. So that practical experience takes conversations that I have with labels and distributors and publishers to the next level right out of the gates. We don't have to talk about ISRC to ISWC linking, and they don't have to tell me what that means. I do that on my laptop at night and on the weekend. And I, I do make physical product and I release it digitally and I do it globally and I manage their UGC channels. And it means that I have a very detailed practical experience relating to how these works end up in the pipes that we then are dealing with at enormous scale in the HFA, Rumblefish, and frankly, in our CSAC business and in our other businesses. I, I love that, Michael. It's so cool to hear about how you think about it and and the the level of detail you treat things with, but even the the, the secret codes and and being involved directly with the physical production of it as well. I hope you're going to get all your tracks to this um, new jukebox, jukebox metaverse syndication service that I'm sure will be online any minute now. <laughs> I'm, I'm reproducing gotta... brain chips this evening. <laughs> In my garage. <laughs> right, right. With, I have a stamper and I'm popping out brain chips. I just can't get anybody to a agree to let me pop it into their brain yet. <laughs> That's right. Well, maybe Elon Musk will do that for you. Um, <laughs> hey, this has been fun. Thanks for thanks for letting us um, kind of do the music tectonic style conversation. I don't know if you've you've had an HFA Rumblefish conversation quite like this one, but I sure enjoyed it. But but before we end, what else should the music tech world know about HFA and Rumblefish? Do we cover it all? Any 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 parting words on that that front? Parting words, I would say don't take this the wrong way, but music rights administration is complex. I'm not sure what the wrong way is. That might The wrong way would be to say it's off-putting or only I can understand it. My team understands it. They work on it all day. To launch or expand a music-related offering, a business needs to consider many things. They often don't, and it becomes an unfortunate outcome for them. We like to help them upfront think about how can I obtain a license? How do I link data between my publishing rights and my label deals? How do I program royalty calculations? What's the best format to send to rights holders? Someone says, I have a PDF and I told you what I used. Well, that's great as long as you use one song one time for one rights holder. But at scale, words we use, things like file layouts and how to array the data so that a rights holder and we can ingest it. We have decades, as you heard over the course of this conversation, literally decades of technical expertise, enormously deep industry relationships, and a genuine interest, an interest that rises to the level of, I am personally making vinyl records and administering compositions. I've played in bands and I've toured the Midwest playing in ska bands. It's not an inadvertent professional avocation. It is in my DNA to do this, and it is in the Rumblefish DNA to support music distribution innovation. We help clients understand the music licensing landscape. We connect clients with the publishers that control the songs. We manage direct licensing arrangements. We can help them calculate and pay royalties. And in every type, if this was if this was 100 years ago, we'd be talking about piano rolls and cylinders and discs. Now we're talking about streaming and tablatures and lyrics and labels and fitness companies and background music companies and karaoke. And of course, as you mentioned up front, AR and VR is appearing on our doorstep. Lots of NFT conversations, which is a 19,000 hour podcast that either happened or will happen and I won't <laughs> be in it. Online video services <laughs> and anything else anyone can think of metaverse jukeboxes. That's the world that we live in. It's, it's a super cool thing to go from being a drummer in high school bands and starting to play around the region to becoming a manager of the bands that I played in and seeing them through to major labels and then ending up being a very broad-based publishing rights administrator and going from the world of just, I'm not sure if I like cassettes to cassettes, cassette schmissette. What are you talking about? How about AR, VR? How about I'm, I'm putting on my Oculus and I'm sitting in with the band? And what is that? Yeah. I've got a virtual guitar and I'm playing a solo and there's a spot for me to play the solo. I'm on tour with whoever you want to tour with and I'm joining this band and I'm getting to look out into the audience and see what that feels like. We have those conversations. They're very real. Those businesses are coming and the Rumblefish team 
is designed to help people figure that out. Awesome. This has been a total blast. I appreciate it, Michael. If we have a music tech company listening that wants to get your help, how should they reach out to you? They should start by emailing services at rumblefish.com, which is the word services, like S-E-R-V-I-C-E-S at rumblefish.com. If they don't go through that channel, of course, we're very available online through all all media and easy to find. But services at rumblefish.com is a good place to start. Great. We're, we're looking in there all the time and we get back to people very quickly. Hey, you guys were in the metaverse. I mean, you guys had a, had a booth at the Music Tectonics online conference a few weeks ago too. So they, they'll find you there. They'll find you everywhere. All right, Michael, great talking with you. I hope to see you in a real life conference soon and appreciate your time. Thanks for listening to Music Tectonics. If you like what you hear, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We have new episodes for you every week. Did you know you can dig deeper into all our episodes with the show notes at musictectonics.com. While you're there, look for the latest about our annual conference, sign up for our newsletter to get updates, or get the Music Tectonics app for music tech news. Everything we do explores seismic shifts that shake up music and technology the way the Earth's tectonic plates cause quakes and make mountains. Connect with Music Tectonics on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and find me, Dimitri Vitsa, if you can spell it, on LinkedIn. Bye-bye. You're listening to Music Tectonics.